Hi, it's Jamie from Guildbrook Farm. On April 25, 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake rocked the little country of Nepal, killing over 9,000 people and injuring over 25,000 people. And I was there in the middle of it, traveling alone. This is my untold story. A massive earthquake triggers an avalanche, destroying history in seconds and triggering a desperate search for survivors. A quake so big it shook Mount Everest. Now the United States is sending a disaster response team and one million dollars in aid. The worst disaster Nepal has seen in nearly a century. At Mount Everest, shockwaves triggered a massive avalanche, sending snow, ice and boulders onto a base camp. The earthquake struck before noon local time in the capital city of Kathmandu. With tremors felt across the region in India, Bangladesh and Tibet. The impact wiped away history in a matter of minutes. So more than 1,400 people killed at this point. When I decided to uh, quit my job and uh, find out what I wanted to do with my life, um, I was torn between two worlds. I was I'm quite the adventurer. I absolutely love um, traveling and uh, hiking and I've been skydiving and scuba diving. I've done a lot of adventurous things in my life and I was torn between that world but I'm also a kind of person that likes to settle down. Uh, I was wanting to have a place of my own, put down roots. I've been traveling most of my life and I thought you know it might be nice to actually settle down and have a place and get settled in. Those are completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So in order to find that out, I decided to go on a once in a lifetime trip to a country that uh, always had magic, held a little bit of magic for me, and that was the country of Nepal. Now Nepal is nestled between uh, India and Tibet, China. A little tiny country that uh, is home to the Himalayan mountains and to Mount Everest. Now originally I had wanted to hike to base camp of Mount Everest, but uh, I was in no physical shape to, to hike to base camp. So uh, when I was planning this trip, I decided to hike to uh, another mountain, which was uh, Poon Hill. It's called Poon Hill, but it actually uh, is about 10,000 feet in elevation. So there, there is still a chance of having altitude sickness climbing up there and it's a uh, pretty steep hill, hill as they call it. So uh, uh, that was where I decided to go. I um, had booked my flight for just myself. I somehow couldn't convince anybody to go with me. So I was a female traveling alone to, to this country that uh, I had never been before. And I didn't speak the language and uh, I did a lot of research on it though. So I booked my flight from April 13th and uh, I was to return on April 30th. Uh, I flew in to Tamil, which is the capital of Nepal. And from there, I had uh, stayed in several hostels. Now, um, another reason for traveling to Nepal is it, it is fairly inexpensive, uh, at least compared to traveling to, say, Europe or uh, even around the United States. Uh, rooms are anywhere between 7 and $10 a night. Uh, meals are fairly inexpensive. So um, pretty much the most expensive part of, the, of this trip was my flight over there. So for someone uh, going on a trip to find themselves, um, this was a good option for me. So I, I, as I said, I went into Tamil, spent a few nights there visiting the city, uh, and it was in Tamil that um, I had booked with a uh, adventure agency to uh, hire a guide and a Sherpa to take me to Poon Hill. Um, and the next day uh, I met up with my guide and uh, we got on a bus and we traveled um, it was a couple hours to the uh, city of Pokhara. And Pokhara, Pokhara is where, uh, where we started our hike up to Poon Hill. Now the trek up to Poon Hill, um, it was about a four day journey. And when I say it's uphill, it was straight uphill. We were hiking, there, there are rocks, uh, rock steps that were cut into the mountain but they were basically very vertical and there was 
there's a lot of traffic on those roads and they were, they were very, very narrow pathways, I should call roads. Um, there are donkeys and stuff that would, that would be traveling up and down the mountains uh, along with us. And we'd have to move close to the mountainside so that the donkeys didn't push us off the cliff. Uh, very real, um, very real uh, hiking up there. And uh, we stayed in several tea houses along the way. These tea houses were uh, absolutely amazing. Um, they were owned locally by the Nepali people, and uh, they cooked for you there. Um, and uh, they were just really wonderful stays. I really enjoyed the little towns and seeing the different uh, people along the way and what and how people lived. Um, so I, I hiked up to Poon Hill, and I got to see the beautiful Himalayan mountains. And I'm out of here. And uh, then we uh, hiked back down where uh, my guide and I boarded a bus. Now here's kind of where, uh, as if that wasn't adventurous enough, here's where the real adventure started to begin. So on the trip home, uh, the trip between Pokhara and Tamel is very, very dangerous. There is high traffic. Uh, it's a very, very high traffic area and everyone's trying to pass everyone. There are no guardrails and there is a steep drop off cliff that goes down to a river below. Now this river I'm told has nets in it because um, there are so many buses that fall off the cliff that the nets are there to catch the bodies. Uh, that's how dangerous this road is. And on our trip home, literally, I would say 10 minutes before we got to this particularly uh, dangerous area, uh, there was an accident. Uh, a, an Indian bus uh, carrying 12 people had gone over the cliff. And uh, I saw the aftermath of that. Uh, they were carrying people up in body bags along that cliff. Uh, that was extremely scary. And right before that, as on the trip home, we had some locals on the bus that got into a fist fight. Uh, again, a very realistic scenario here uh, on, my, on my little adventure. But I made it back safely to Tamel. And uh, from Tamel, that is where I traveled on to um, the little town of Bakhtapur. Now, Bakhtapur is just outside of Tamel, and there are a lot of uh, beautiful, uh, very, very old monuments and uh, temples there that I had wanted to see. So I had booked a room there. Uh, it was a little hotel, had several stories, and uh, I was staying on the second floor. Now, I was planning on staying there for a couple days to travel before going on to another town where I would be able to view Mount Everest. I wasn't planning on climbing it, but um, there was a, a tower that I could go to to actually see it, uh, hopefully on a clear day. So that was my next stop, but I never made it. And uh, here's what happened. Uh, while I was staying in Back to Prayer, I spent most of my days sure traveling the town the and uh, just visiting the different vendors. There's fruit vendors along the street, um, candy vendors. I picked up some candy for my kids. And um, and I would just walk the streets during the day, you know, have a nice leisurely lunch, go visit the temples, and then I'd go back to my room, maybe read a little bit. Uh, meanwhile, I'm texting my husband. So one of the things that I did when I first arrived to Nepal was uh, I brought with me an old phone that I was able to put a chip in it so that I could use the cell service in Nepal. It was very important to me to have communication, especially traveling alone uh, to this country. So I was able to text my husband and uh, it was probably close to noon or around somewhere around noon and I'm just texting him and I was saying goodnight to him because it was his bedtime at that point. And as I'm texting him, uh, I all of a sudden started vibrating violently and it took probably a split second for me to realize that this was an earthquake. Uh, I immediately texted my husband that, holy shit, it's an earthquake, is exactly what I texted him. And I grabbed my purse, which had my most important items in it, and threw on my shoes and ran downstairs. Now, by the time I had my shoes on and my purse, it was, the quake was nearing the end. It was probably about a 30 second uh, quake. Um, and I had gone downstairs and all the people from the hotel were there standing near the doorways. Uh, and 
I mean, looking out the doors, uh, there is just decimation. Um, there were uh, the buildings had fallen around me, all around me, and. As I'm standing there, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I don't know what the situ- I know I needed to get outside, but it was already over, so... Did I still need to get outside? I wasn't sure what to do, I wasn't sure what the, how bad the damage was. And I, I, and I could tell from the people around me that they were very shaken up by this, um, as was I. Um, but it didn't help to have all the, the locals shaken up as well, and I didn't know what they were saying. I could not understand the, the language. I ended up going outside of the hotel, and there is, you have to understand where I was located, there are, uh, there's not a lot of open space. There was one open square, but there are basically towers and buildings very, very tall around me, and it's these towers that are crumbling. And I went out to the square where a bunch of people were, and as I'm standing there, all these people are huddled together. There were like hundreds of people huddled together, huddled together in this little square, and an aftershock hit. And... There were probably a total of about, uh, I think they said about 120 aftershocks that averaged around 5.5 magnitude. Now, most people, when they feel an earthquake, at least here in the United States, they're, you're usually feeling something about that, uh, maybe a little bit even less. These were continual aftershocks that we felt every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, around magnitudes of 5.5. That is a lot. So while I'm standing here in the square, there are hundreds of people around. I'm seeing bodies laying on the ground, uh, people taking care of very badly injured people. People are literally packed together like sardines in the square, and I'm tr trying to stay a little bit away from them. And all of a sudden, another one of these aftershocks hits. And I'm watching these towers that are around the square, and they're swaying back and forth like this. I mean, uh, violently swaying, and uh, the people are like in the in the square are like screaming and they're shifting because we don't know if this tower is coming down on us. I realized at that point that I was probably safer in the building that I was at than I would be out in this open because one of two things are going to happen. You got a tower here, a tower here, a tower here, and one of these towers is going to come down on all of us and we're going to all die. Or I'm going to get trampled by this crowd because they were freaked out and they were shifting and moving. Um, and I knew I didn't want to be there. In a typical earthquake situation, you want to be out in the open. This was a very unique situation where these buildings are very, very poorly constructed. Uh, I don't think there's any building codes over there in Nepal. It seems like most of the buildings are put together with brick and sawdust. And, uh, and when the earthquakes hit, these, these buildings came crumbling down. But my building seemed a little more stable. At least it made it through the first couple uh, earthquakes, uh, or the first major earthquake, and then the following shock. So I ran back to that building, and along with several other people, I was standing in the doorway, uh, waiting to see if I could go outside or not. So several aftershocks had happened, and, and they kept getting further and further apart. But I'm trying to find out what exactly was happening? What was the damage? Was this just local? Was this um, the whole city? Was this the whole country? And I think that was probably the most frustrating part was not being able to understand. They had the news on at the time and I was trying to understand what was going on and I I'm trying to talk to the owner who spoke a little bit of English and my understanding was everything was decimated. Everything. I'm trying to make plans in my head. Where do I go? What do I do? This is the first thing that I'm thinking about. Um, I'm trying to text my husband. Well, guess what? Cell towers went out. There was no texting. There was no looking up information on my phone. My phone was out. The only thing that I could do was to try and gauge the situation. My understanding was that all of Tamil was destroyed. I tried to find out about the U.S. Embassy because that was my next plan. Now, the U.S. Embassy is in Tamil and I'm was in Bactapur, which was just outside of Tamil. And uh, my understanding was that the U.S. Embassy was destroyed. There was no going there. I tried a little bit later finding out, uh, all right, so do I go to the airport? Uh, my understanding was that the airport had cracked. The runway had cracked, and we didn't know if the airport was still standing. It's a pretty scary situation to be in, folks. You don't speak the language. You're trying to find out what's going on. Your phone doesn't work. You don't have access to your family. Um, before my phones had gone out, uh, I had sent my husband a text, other than the holy shit, it's an earthquake, 
but sent them a text that I loved them, and I sent my kids a text that I loved them because I didn't think it was coming back from this guy's. Uh, it was that bad. Uh, I The only thing I could do was hold on and wait and see what my plan was uh, or what was going on. I was trying to figure out if I needed to actually hike it out of there and go to, uh, say, an airport in India. Uh, was was India still standing? Was there, where was the local airport there? I had no maps, nothing. Uh, I mean, I had local maps. I had maps of, of all of Nepal, but I didn't have maps of, of India. I uh, wasn't planning on hiking to India. I didn't know where to go and what to do. So until I had a plan, I was staying put. <clears throat> so what I ended up doing was uh, staying in the room and my flight out now, the, the earthquake happened on April 25th, and my flight out was on April 29th, um, assuming that there were still flights. Now, another option was that a, and then a lot of people I found out later on had done was they had gone to the airport and they were camping outside the airport. So that was an option that I could do. I could have hiked over there, but uh, first of all, there was no way of getting there. I would have had to walk would have had to walk. The roads, from my understanding, were destroyed. They, the earthquake had cracked open the roads. There were no taxis running. And there was no way of getting there other than to hike. And then once I got there, I didn't have a tent to stay in, and I didn't have food. Now, as these earthquakes are going on, I'm talking to the owner, and the first thing that I asked him was, do you have enough food to feed me until I can get to the airport? And he said yes. He was able to feed me uh, because that was a, my main concern. Uh, now, being a prepper, um, before the earthquake even happened, uh, I try to stay very prepared. I, I was not expecting an earthquake, and I think that's probably the biggest thing when it comes to prepping. You don't expect what's going to happen. You can anticipate different events, events, but you really, it's it's preparing for the unexpected that that, that really shows how well prepared you are and. When I'm doing these hiking, when I was hiking around the town and, and visiting the different fruit vendors, I would always pick up some food. I would always uh, store water. So I had a supply of water in my room, and I had uh, some fresh fruit, fruits. I had some food, and I had some, um, I think I had some packs of uh, nutrition shakes. I also had the water there. You cannot drink the water at all in Nepal. Um, I had been buying bottled water up to that point, but I did have a Steri pen as well in a, as a backup situation. Um, and also, right before the earthquake hit, I had made sure, uh, I always made sure that I had cash on hand, so I hit the ATM, uh, which turned out to be uh, very, that was a very good thing that I did, because once the earthquake hit, there was no ATMs. I had to end up using that money to buy my way out of Nepal, to buy a, uh, to buy my stay there, and to get my ride out of there. Um, really, this is probably the ultimate prepping scenario where prepping, I talked about this in a previous video, how, how being prepared has helped me in numerous situations. This was probably the ultimate situation. Uh, I was able to stay in my room. I had some food. I had a guy that was going to supply me with more food. I had some water. I had a backup supply uh, or a Steri pen to get myself more water. Um, and I just needed to figure out what my plan was. So here we are, uh, it's the night of April 25th, and uh, my plan was to stay put. Uh, I didn't want to hike to the airport and st stay outside where there was absolutely no food. I thought my options were better staying in this building. Um, and it turned out to be a very good call on my end. And so what I did was, is I went to bed. Uh, there was no way that, uh, there were a lot of people that were camping out in uh, the square. Um, I wasn't going to do that. I thought my chances of, first of all, the towers coming down on top of you, and also the chances of getting um, uh, looted were extremely high. And that wasn't a chance that I was going to take. I felt my options were better in this room. But you need to, you need to understand that while I'm staying in this room, there were continual aftershocks of 5.5 magnitude all night. This was a horrific and scary, scary, scary situation. If you've never been in an earthquake, or for, even if you have been in an earthquake, it, chances are most times you're in a very stable building. I am in very, very unstable structures, and 
with very unstable structures around me and uh, the thoughts of being buried alive were very very real um, the possibility of being buried alive was very real in particular at night the lights go out and you're laying there and I had a headlamp in my hand and I had my bug out bag and I had my shoes on and I was ready to go and you're, you're just laying there and you would, you, you got to get some sleep you start dozing off and next thing you know you hear this rumbling and you know it's coming you hear it first and then all of a sudden the whole building starts shaking and and you're violently shaking in bed and this is the middle of the night pitch blackness it's scary shit guys it really really is and it happened all through the night uh, every it's like I said it started off really close together and started spacing out to every couple hours but it happened that way the entire time I was there so the next day I would wake up and uh, I would <laughs> was glad that I was able to wake up and I would go out to the square and I would analyze the situation first check my phone see if I was able to get cell service I was not the entire time I was there um, the whole time I was trying to think of how do I get in touch with my husband now one of the things that I noticed is that um, the guy that owned the hotel had a landline and the phones were ringing and he was talking on the phone I could not dial out I did not have uh, a way of calling internationally on his phone my only hope was that my husband had the foresight to at least try to contact that hotel. He knew I was staying there. That was the last place I was staying. And I had hoped that he had tried to reach me. It turns out that he is a very smart man. And uh, I would say probably on, I think it was on day two, I get a knock on my door from this little girl who says, someone's trying to reach you. I told him to call back. Now, keep in mind, these people do not speak English very fluently. Apparently, uh, my husband had tried to call several times, and various people who um, the, the owner had, was hosting several people. Uh, he had the whole, whole hotel filled with Nepali people um, trying to, that were uh, displaced. And so there were different people answering the phone, and they did not speak English. But this one little girl, who was probably about 12 years old, had uh, spoken a little bit of English, and she's the one that picked up the phone when my husband called. And she came up and got me and said, he's going to call back in a few minutes. And I stood by that phone. Sure enough, I got my husband on the line, and we were able to find out what's going on and to uh, cement the plan that I had that I had made. So uh, he was watching the news, and he had realized what I had realized, which was that there was pretty much total decimation of the country, that the airport was closed, and that my best bet was to stay put. Um, so we were on the same plan. We made a plan to uh, continue to call, that he was going to continue to call me um, every day at a certain time, so I needed to stay by the phone. But uh, just having that phone call from him uh, was a huge relief for me, and I'm sure it was for him as well to know that I was still alive <laughs> and uh, not buried in, a, in another country under some rubble. Um, so I stayed put. Now, well, folks, some of you guys watch different preppers talking about uh, prepping for certain um, SHTF situations and they speculate as to what that's going to look like. This was a real situation um, and I can tell you in the third world country it was more real for me because uh, I did not speak the language. I didn't know what was going on. So let's talk about how that actually looks what actually happened. Now the first thing that happened was uh, there was no government support. You guys think that the government's coming to save you in certain situations um, depending on the, the how badly decimated the country is there's not going to be government support. In this particular situation this country is a very small country so there when it, when it was decimated there was nobody there to come and save everybody. It wasn't happening. There was no military. There was no cops. There was nobody around. Why? Because these people are taking care of their own families. Um, now, in the United States, that might be a little bit different. Our country is so large that there might be an area that is not hit that can come and help the area that is hit. Um, it really just depends on the size of the decimation. But in this particular situation that I was in, there was nobody there to help. Now another thing that happened is there was looting. Um, I was locked into my I was locked in my hotel room at night, and I was with what turned out to be uh, 
uh, a godsend of, of an owner that decided to take me under his wing and take care of me. I don't know how many people you know would take care of a foreigner um, when he has his family to take care of, but this family took me in and they took care of me. They made sure to feed me uh, twice a day and they made sure that uh, I was had a room, a roof over my head, and eventually this guy ended up getting me to the airport. He was the, my informant. He's the one that told me what was going on. And he's the one that kept me safe at night when there was looting. Uh, yes, I could hear the looting outside. I could hear people breaking the windows and getting food and water. Uh, that's a very another real situation. And the other thing was is um, eventually I did get to the airport. So the roads were closed. The, uh, there, the roads were just broken open. Um, I wouldn't say they're closed. They're just, there were cracks in it. There was, there was no taxis running. There were no ambulances running. There was, uh, everyone was maxed out to their full capacity with what they were doing. People were helping each other there. And so my way of getting to the airport was to, my only way of getting to the airport was either to hike out of there or to find a ride um, from somebody who was able to get there. And that meant motorcycle because there were no cars that were able to drive on these roads. So the owner ended up, who's this uh, fairly large man, he and I got on the back of a motorcycle and he's the one that drove me to the airport on the day that my flight flew out. And uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm really glad I hit up that ATM before the earthquake happened. I gave that man every dime that I had in my wallet. I was so thankful for him to take care of me over the period of, I think it was um, five or six days, I was locked in my room. I didn't go out. I was scared to go out. Uh, I was afraid of, uh, of the looting of the people that were there. And any time that I did go out of the room, like to check my cell phone service the one time a day, uh, I noticed that I was the only foreigner there. Everybody else had left. Um, so they, uh, where, the, where they'd gone, I don't know. I don't know if they were just cramp camping outside the airport or not. When I did get to the airport, I did see a lot of campers there. But uh, yeah, it was, I would say that uh, a lot of this, I was very heavily reliant on the owner to um, take care of my needs. Now, if he wasn't able to do that, I had a plan of getting out of there, like I said, and hiking, uh, hiking out of there. But uh, I'm glad I didn't have to do that because to hike through a city that is decimated where people are displaced um, as a foreigner, uh, I was a little scared of what might happen to me, to be honest. But uh, thankfully that didn't happen. I made it to the airport on time. Now, another thing to note here is they would not let people in the airport. It's a good thing that I stayed in my hotel because when I got to the airport, there were guards, a couple guards there that would not let people into the airport unless you had a ticket. Now, I had no printed ticket. I had it on my phone. But by the time I got to the airport, uh, which was several days later, they had a couple cell phone towers up and I did get service right there. I was able to pull up my electronic ticket on my phone and show the guard, in which case he let me pass through and get on my flight, which I got safely out of there. But uh, guys, this was a very, very scary situation So that I had lived through, and I am very grateful that I was able to, believe it or not, I was able to live through that situation. It was an experience unlike any other. I took away from it a lot of information. One um, is that I made that decision that uh, I wasn't going to travel for a living, I wasn't going to be a nomad, that I did want to settle down. And it didn't so much have to do with the fact that I was in an earthquake. Um, it wasn't that I was scared of traveling. That's not why I made the decision. Why I made the decision was because I realized that being that, that earthquakes can happen anywhere, that natural disasters can happen anywhere, and it was the people that were prepared in Nepal that were well off. and. When I came back home, I wanted to be prepared for any situation that might arise here. Now, the guy that uh, took care of me, he was probably the only one in that town that had a generator. And he cranked up that generator, and I was able to charge my uh, phone and my iPod during those what was it, five or six days that I was locked in my room. And uh, that allowed me to, one, be able to entertain myself by reading a book that I had on it which was some pretty important because uh, I needed to get my mind off of what was happening, off of these constant uh, earthquake tremors that were happening. And the other thing was, is I was able to take my phone, go out to the square and see if I could get service and just try and contact my husband. And, and it turned out to be good that I had my phone charged by the time I got to the airport so I could show my, 
my uh, ticket. Um, and the other thing was, is this guy, like I said, uh, he had enough food and water to um, supply me, uh, a, a stranger, uh, a foreigner, with some food. And which was really important because while the earthquakes were happening, I noticed that they have a water catchment system, catchment system on top of the roof that cracked and broke. Um, and that was their water supply. And the water ended up did, getting contaminated. There was a lot of cholera over there. And towards the end of those several days that I was there, I started getting sick. Um, another really important thing to remember if you are preparing for a situation like this, you know, water and food, extremely important. Now, I was able to get out of there after several days, but the Nepali people had to stay there and there was no help coming. There was relief that was that ended up flying in. Uh, after several days, they were able to repair the runway enough to get uh, to get uh, first aid workers in or relief aid workers in that were helping, but there was only so many workers and they were only going to so many areas. They could not get to everybody. And so I cannot stress the importance of having food and water and, and a good shelter for any situation like this that might arise. And if you guys are planning on government coming in and helping you, it's not going to happen depending on where you are and how bad the situation is. It didn't happen in this situation. There was no law in this country during that period that I was there. As far as a matter of fact, when I got to the airport, there were, I would say, less than five people, five to ten people staffing the entire airport. Where are these people? They were home with their families, digging them out of the rubble. Very real situation, guys. So this is uh, my untold story of the Nepali earthquake of 2015. Um, I did survive a 7.8 magnitude earthquake and uh, the aftershocks after that, and uh, one of which was 6.6 uh, .6 magnitude. And I actually got that on camera. And uh, I can tell you that the video footage that I got does not even closely uh, come close to what it actually felt like being there because uh, as as the camera's moving, the building's moving, so you really don't see just, there's no reference to see how bad it's vibrating. And, uh, and you, you really can't replicate the fear of that building coming down on you uh, in a video. But... Uh, Yes, guys, that's that's why I'm here. That's one of the reasons that I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, it's really not just reason A or reason B. There are tons of reasons why I have a homestead here and why I'm preparing. Um, you never know what's going to happen. You really don't. And, and being prepared for any situation and covering, you know, your basics, which are food, water, shelter, uh, the most important thing. You just never know what's going to happen. Um, if you guys have ever been in a survival situation like this, I want to hear from you. Uh, leave your comments below. And if you have any questions or comments, leave those below as well. I'd love to hear from you. I'm going to leave you with some footage. I did take a documentary um, while I was there in Nepal. I didn't think I was coming home, but I thought I might as well shoot this documentary anyway. So this is a little bit long. It's an additional 10 minutes or so. Uh, forgive me and if any swearing you hear during the video or anything. Uh, this was a, this was it real, guys. Um, so enjoy, and I'll see you next time. This is an earthquake. I knew it was due about one o'clock. That was a pretty good one, too. Fucking scary shit, dude. Nothing you can do. So this is my mini documentary on the earthquake in Nepal, 2015. Uh, this is my room, basically my prison for the last week, but could be worse, I'll show you.
there's some sort of strange odor coming out of the sink. I'm not sure what that is. Some sort of methane from the pipes not having elbows or um, traps. Uh, 30 minutes a day starting around 10 a.m. They start up the generator and thank God this place has a generator. If you can probably hear it. And I'm charging my devices. Which have been a godsend because basically I just stay in this room and read books the entire time. Um, my room is fairly safe. My only concern, I don't know if you can see it, the uh, started to crack all around the windows and that's around both windows but other than that the rest of the room is doesn't have any cracks in it so that's pretty good my other concern is this building across from me and I'm going to show that to you because this is very unstable right now and this is a family of the owners that's so like their sister his sister So that's probably, I want to say, maybe 10 paces across to that house, and it's fairly tall. If that comes down, it's definitely going to come down uh, on my room. Um, but today's day two of the earthquake, so I don't think we're going to get any more big tremors. Yesterday was the big tremor around 1 p.m., and uh, I don't think we're going to get any more big ones, hopefully. Um, they say that the tremors last for 72 hours, so tomorrow at noon should be the absolute last of it. I have been feeling a lot of tremors throughout the day. Um, obviously scares the bejesus out of me every time they start. Some are little, some are large. Last night there were quite a few of them in a row at night in pitch blackness. Um, and those are pretty scary. There's nothing you can do but just to roll over and try and go back to sleep. I'm going to show you this construction site over here. But that's another uh, house of the owner, another family, um, and that collapsed last night uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, luckily, that family was sleeping out in the square. Um, there is one other huge concern, and that is further on down that street and to the right, I would say probably, I don't even know if you can see it, I'm going to try and hold my phone out the window, but is the giant temple. And so far it's still standing, but if that comes down and it leans this way, that could be pretty detrimental to this place. I'll see if I can show it on here. I don't think I can get it um, around the corner of the building. There is another temple right there, which is a lot shorter, and um, that one's been swaying quite a bit. I was actually on the square when one of the tremors hit, and that thing was swaying pretty profusely. That's when I ran back to the hotel because I didn't want to be in that square when that temple came down or the one right next to it, the really big tall one that I'm talking about initially. Um, so that's it. This is my room. Had a little prison. Um, I have my little purse here. This is my bug out bag. It has everything in it that I need. Water, my uh, water sanitizer. I've been hoarding half of my food that they give me. I have baggies of rice um, because they eat, they don't have much food here and they're sharing what they have with me. Basically I get fed about 10 a.m. and about 8 p.m. and that consists of about three cups of rice, probably maybe three quarters of a cup of soup. Um, sometimes it's just bean soup, today it was just bean soup and dal. Um, Last night it was, had some vegetables in it, and um, sometimes that's it, and sometimes uh, there's something else, like today, oh, there's a tremor right now, it was just a little one, uh, and sometimes it's uh, something else, like today I had some relish, which was really nice, actually. Um, I actually don't mind just eating rice. Um, actually, I don't mind eating anything as long as I get the hell out of here at some point, but I still have a couple packs of... Uh, um, Protein shakes, I have three of them left. I have a couple of bottles of water. 
And that would be, and there's one empty bottle there, and there's about one and three quarter full ones. I've been rationing about one a day. I also have whatever's in my bag. Uh, and I had some fruit that I bought before the earthquake. I've been rationing that too. I'm down to about a banana and a pomegranate. Um, I also have three power bars in my purse that, uh, and a couple pieces of dried fruit and a bar of chocolate. Um, so that's about it. Uh, again, today's Monday, April 23rd, I think. No, nope. 23rd, 27th. Monday, April 27th at 10.36 a.m. And, uh, I just basically have to sit here for another two days. That's it. Okay, so it's a little after 8 p.m. on, I think, the 27th. And uh, I just got dinner. I mean, I got a big meal this time. I'll show you what I got. Um, so this is quite possibly the best egg I've ever had. Uh, fried egg. I think it was like two. That's dal soup. We got like two cups of rice. And that is curry. And I put away some rice for tomorrow. Because I can't eat like they do here. They eat big meals. <clears throat> and uh, eat it all at once. And I have to parse mine out a little bit. So, anyway. That's that.